Thank you very much, Dr. Stankovic. Thank you very much to the faculty and the residents for welcoming me. Is it, can I move that thing? I don't know. I'm going to text it. I am not capable of moving that thing. Um, so thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Um, it's really, really a pleasure. Um, I don't know what I did. Yeah. There you go. Um, there you so go. I don't have any disclosures. Um, I've done some of the things that Tina said. Um, and uh, during the pandemic, everyone said you should get a podcast. So we made a video podcast called She's on Call. And we have 59 episodes. If you want to meet some very cool, interesting medical people, uh, my colleague Marina Korean and I interviewed them. We did uh, weekly shows pretty much for um, a year and a half. And that was really fun. Um, and I am consulting editor for Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America. Um, we, if you have ideas and you'd like to write a clinics, uh, be a guest editor, please let me know. Um, we also record a podcast per issue um, with the guest editors, and that's really fun. It's a very nice way to learn some otolaryngology while you're on the treadmill or on your commute. Um, so. For this talk on unconscious bias, um, I had a few objectives, and I used the words that Stanford told me I had to use, because <laughs> I was like, okay, um, we're going to analyze the concept of unconscious bias, and we're going to acknowledge that we all have it. We're going to incorporate some terms that are that may be new to some people, but are very important, and are much more descriptive of the issues that are going on. Uh, we're going to examine something called imposter syndrome and how our understanding of that has changed. And then we're going to assess why we care about any of this. And then if we do care about this, how we are going to overcome both individual and group biases. And um, Jennifer Vilwak from the University of Kansas was the guest editor for a special series in clinics um, that, sorry, my family is talking about <laughs> the cowboys or something, um, um, on, uh, on diversity and inclusion and intentionally shaping the future of otolaryngology. So it's two uh, articles per issue for a year of clinics. And um, I think when you talk about DEI, you must talk about bias and how that affects it. And when you talk about bias, you must talk about DEI and how each affects the other. So what is unconscious bias? So unconscious bias is also called implicit bias, and it's prejudice or unsupported judgments in favor of or against a certain thing, person, or group as compared to another in a way that's usually considered unfair. So if you do a word cloud, you can see the words that come up with unconscious bias, and it's, it, it's considered to be hidden and quite unfair and really does affect various aspects of all of our lives. <clears throat> so as an example of unconscious bias, um, you may have noticed that my prior slides were a nice red color that Stanford is very famous for. I initially thought about making a blue slide background, but then I thought you guys might subconsciously <laughs> think of your arch enemies. Recording in progress. Um, and, and maybe be unhappy and unwilling to listen to me. So even though my son did go to UCLA, go Bruins, um, I'm going to go back to Stanford Red. Um, so by us understanding and overcoming unconscious bias, that doesn't only help the individual group of pers or person, but it actually helps everyone. And it does not hurt the majority group or person. And I think that's really important. So they say, oh, a rising tide um, lifts all ships. But actually, if your ship is the rowboat at the very bottom, you need more um, help to get up to an equal playing field than the sailboat or the luxury yacht. But all of them need help. And when you help everyone, you help everyone. And so the, the rich person in the yacht was not hurt by this. The middle person in the sailboat was not hurt by this. The less um, economically wealthy person in the rowboat was not hurt by this. All people are helped by this. 
So there are two types of biases. There's explicit bias and there's implicit bias. And for the trainees, I'm so, in some ways, I'm so glad you're training now where people know to keep their mouths shut for the most part. <laughs> Um, but I'm kind of sad that you're training now because people do keep their mouths shut and you may, we had so many, um, so much armor that we developed in our training against these biases because they were, del they were just said to us. I was told, oh, girls don't go into surgery. And I'm like, well, they do because I'm going into surgery. And then they would say, why do you want to take a seat from a man? I mean, these are just, just like the sky is blue, why are you taking a seat from a man? And I would say, well, no, he, that man can take his seat and I could take my seat and there's lots of seats, right? So we kind of had so much overt or explicit bias that maybe we de developed a little bit more skill set in dealing with the implicit bias and maybe we didn't. So explicit is consciously held, it's accessible and tangible, it's activated volitionally, it can be combated with logic and reasoning because it exists. So you can say, well, I noticed that you said that. And what you did when you said that was this. And did you really mean to say that? Um, and I've had that kind of conversation before I knew any of these other words. I've had that because I'm a New Yorker. So I just say, say what I think. It's overt. It's easier to measure. Um, it's often deliberate discrimination. And currently, it's quite less common um, and it's relatively easier to contain. Implicit or unconscious bias is really unconsciously held. Many, many people are not aware of their unconscious biases. So it then becomes inaccessible, intangible. It's activated unintentionally and therefore difficult to counter with any sort of logic or reasoning. It's difficult to measure um, and it can cause unintended discrimination but unfortunately, it is widely prevalent, and it's a little difficult to mitigate. So um, the IAT is an implicit association test that was created at Harvard. 76% um, <clears throat> of all respondents in the current day and age associated men with career and women with family. That's it. And that was true of both genders, of all genders, a everyone who took this um, took this test. 75% of all respondents preferred white people to black people. I don't even know what that means, but they did. And this was true <coughs> of over 50% of black participants as well. So there are some biases that, you know, the, the questions are very subtle in this IAT. Um, they're kind of scary to take. I have to tell you, you have to like be ready to assess yourself but it's worthwhile taking it and trying to see where is it that I am um, not acting the way I would like to act. So explicit bias, you can say there's a sign in the window of an apartment building, only whites need apply for this apartment. Implicit bias is there's no sign in the apartment building, but somehow the non-white uh, potential tenant gets a bigger background check, maybe a bigger criminal check, maybe gets in some way redlined or, or um, removed from the ability to live in a place that is beneficial to them and their family. So snap judgments are forms of implicit bias. And we use snap judgments all the time. We look at this room and we say, oh, there's this kind of person, that kind of person, that kind of person. And we may be judgmental and not even know it. Oh, that one's fat, this one's skinny, that one's rich, this one's poor, that one's black, this one's white, whatever. But we use these automatic um, mental shortcuts so we can process information and make decisions quickly. And we rely on snap judgments in life because lots of things are coming at us. So your snap judgment of whether you're going to be able to get through that yellow light or you're going to stop and not cause an accident, that's a snap judgment. You know, what you're going to do if uh, some rabid dog is attacking you, hopefully you'll run away very quickly. You won't kind of process it or think about it. But those are system one reactions. So these are first reactions. They're fast, they're automatic, they're impulsive, they take no effort, and they're very emotional reactions. Um, but they are 
95% of how we react is this way. System two reactions are thinking reactions. And these take a little bit of time. They're deliberate. They're reflective. They're effortful. And they're analy analytical. And if we can try to make the balance towards more thinking and less of these snap judgments for the things that matter, the things we're talking about, um, I think that's a really interesting way to address our own implicit biases and overcome them to get to a better place. So I'm going to start with a couple of stories. The first time I gave a talk on, my, on implicit bias, um, a colleague of mine from one of the Ivy League ENT programs in the East Coast had called me. This was during the pandemic. Um, he's white male. He um, was just devastated by what a young African-American uh, intern of his had just happened to mention to him. She wasn't complaining about it. She just happened to mention that this happened. And he was just taken aback because he didn't know that this happened. And he wanted to do something about it. And I really commend him. He searched around in his, in his brain Rolodex, and I came up. And he was like, Suj, can you talk to our community about implicit bias? And it's a pretty tough subject to talk about. Um, but this was her story. She was ready for rounds. She came early to neurosurgery floor, and she was standing there, and a nurse came up to her and said, oh, good, you're here. The patient in bed two needs to get to CAT scan. Because African-American woman in scrubs, despite her badge, despite her stethoscope, despite everything, was considered to be transport by this nurse. That was an implicit bias there. And most of us face these kind of biases every single day. Like the number of times that I was asked, where's the doctor? While I, I one guy in particular, the female hand fellow and I were operating on him. He had, you know, you know, as you do, he had torn some tendons in his hand climbing over some barbed wire. <laughs> it happens. And, uh, and so it was the middle of the night at Bellevue Hospital, and she and I were operating, we're talking, and he wakes up from his stupor uh, while we're operating and says, hey, when's the doctor getting here? And then she, uh, with her fabulous Italian accent, she's like, the out of the doctor. Yeah, I can't do an Italian. <laughs> she doesn't sound Russian. Um, <laughs> you know, we had to like say, what, what are you talking about? We're operating on you, right? So it's real. So about 10 years ago, um, an Indian woman surgeon is in the intensive care unit about 6.30 in the morning, checking on my white male acoustic tumor, <laughs> acoustic tumor patient from yesterday. And I had a white coat on. I had my hospital ID on, and it was 6.30 in the morning, and we're talking, and I have a pretty nice relationship with my patients, and sometimes the way to do a mental status exam is just have a chat with your patient, and a young guy barges in, just cleaves right into the middle of the conversation, no hello, no excuse me, no nothing, and just starts talking to the patient. The patient's taken aback, and the, the surgeon is taken aback, and I said, excuse me, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm the PA from neurosurgery. And I said, bully for you. I'm the surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, 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 I thought you were a family member. I said, really? This is how family members come to this ICU? Um, and the patient was post-op like hour 10 or something. Like. It was a late case the prior night. And he remembers to this day the exact nature of this conversation. So not only was that sort of bizarre uh, activity to me, but it really could have undermined the patient's confidence in the care that they were getting from the entire team. So there's a very famous riddle, right? A man and his son are driving. They're in a car accident. The man is killed. The son is brought to the hospital, needs surgery. The surgeon comes down and says, oh, my God, I cannot operate on this person. That's my son, right? And apparently... <laughs> in the celebration of Norman Lear, who lived an amazing life. Um, apparently, this riddle was introduced to America in October of 1972 on an episode of All in the Family. So Gloria, the daughter of the family, asked this riddle of her father, who is a conservative, bombastic, <coughs> any ism that, he, that you could have, Archie had it, guy. And her husband, Mike, or Meathead, 
who was liberal and soft and a women's liber, right? The two ap opposite poles of the, of the world of thought. And neither of them got the answer to the riddle. And you could, well, so the answer of the riddle is the surgeon was the mother, <laughs> is the answer of the riddle. People have answered all crazy things. It's, a, it's a, an adopted child, the stepfather of the cousin's second wife, whatever, I don't, something like that. So the answer is the, the surgeon is the mother. You can say, okay, so nobody got that answer in 1972. In seven studies, that were conducted in and published in 2022, 82% of Americans failed to report that the surgeon could be the boy's mother. That's amazing to me, right? And men and women showed the same levels of stereotype. If you said a man and his child and not a man and his son, that reduced the bias by about 50%. But once you had a man and his son, the mind went to male and that stereotype remained. And this is important because the snap judgment or the type one response when a woman, a person of color, maybe somebody who's gay, maybe somebody who uses a wheelchair or a walker or something, a hearing aid, Somebody that you don't think looks like Marcus Welby, MD, who for you youngins was the doctor on TV forever, <laughs> like a nice old man. Um, <laughs> but if that somebody walks in, the work of getting the patient, the family, the staff, your colleagues to appreciate that you are at least as equal of a doctor as other doctors um, is a lot of work. And it's, and it's really detrimental to the individual person, but actually to the way we can treat society. So uh, one day I was operating with one of my female residents and we were under the microscope, we were doing our thing, and the uh, anesthesiologists were talking and the male attending, uh, just out of the blue, uh, explained to the female resident that pain management is great. If she goes into pain management, she can have kids, she can have a great life, it's nine to five, blah, blah. <clears throat> and, and I looked at Natasha and I was like, did she ask him? <laughs> like, is she trying to get, is she pregnant? Like, what's happening here? It's just a spontaneous piece of advice. And um, I was like, huh, okay. So she hadn't asked and, and later on I asked her, I'm like, are you interested in like some sort of giant family that precludes you from becoming an anesthesiologist? Um, and she wasn't. And so my resident and I were talking over lunch in the little, you know, the hovel where doctors eat. And um, the head of the anesthesia training program, an older woman, tough as nails, overheard the two of us talking and immediately assumed it was a male surgeon talking to a female surgical resident. So there was so much bias that happened within like a two hour period, right? Where there this, this impression that the woman's going to want to um, pull back from full-time care, full-time uh, work by her professor. And maybe she was fated to be the next Marie Curie of anesthesia, right? You don't know, maybe she was gonna make the thing that we don't even know we're looking for. And then the, the person in charge of the anesthesia residents just automatically assumed that that sort of biased statement, biased behavior was coming from a male surgeon, right? And it was sort of like this, it was uh, too many biases all at once, but it happens. Gender bias happens at the podium. So when women introduce speakers, they almost always title them. They almost always say, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Chandrasekhar. And then later on, uh, they may say, well, Sujana and I have been friends for a long time, but we're always introduced by our title. When men introduce um, the same gender, they're about 75% of the time calling them by their title. When they introduce women, they get it right about 50% of the time. And the bias is, if Dr. Sankovic had said, hey, I want you to meet Sujana, she's some chick from New York, she's gonna to talk to you. 
awesome. <laughs> or she said, this is Dr. Chandra Shaker, and we've invited her to speak. And it's just a very different mindset. And that happens when you walk into a patient room. If somebody says, oh, I'm going to call you by your first name, the patient has no idea what your role is in their care. The family has no idea what your, what your role is in the care. And this undermines, this truly undermines the, um, the impact of the speech, the impact of the lecture, the impact of the patient interaction. Um, and so there's some new words. I promised you you'd learn some new words. So um, untitling and uncredentialing happens routinely. And I saw that um, when my sister was in the uh, assistant, dis assistant district attorney's office in the Bronx, she was always called Miss. The judges routinely commented upon her appearance, whether her dress, her skirt was the right length, whether her hair look good. I'm like, she's a DA. She's prosecuting somebody for some drug crime. This is the bad old days when there was really good drug crimes in New York. <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, and I said, oh, thank goodness. My first name is Chandra Sheikh, is doctor, right? My first name is doctor. And, and when that gets removed, people don't know who we are and that we bring something to the table. So um, Francis Collins, who was the prior director of the NIH, um, talked about mammals, and then I introduced that lexicon into otolaryngology. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and um, he had a very clear statement. Actually, I said it before he said it, because I said it in 2017, um, that it was time to end the mammal tradition. And he says it's time to end all male, and, and he meant all white male panels. He said too often women and other members of groups underrepresented in science are conspicuously absent in marque speaking slots at scientific meetings, high-level conferences. People have actually done research on this, and it is statistically impossible for a random selection of speakers at a conference to be all male or all white. It, it only happens if there is uh, implicit bias at work that is guiding the hand of the people who are choosing the speakers. So he said, I'm not going to speak at conferences that do not have diversity. And I think this was a really important thing. Um, in 2017, at the American Neurotology Society meeting, there was an eight-person panel. I'm sure it was a fine panel. It was really hard to focus on the panel because of this problem. And um, it was 2017. It wasn't 1917, and it wasn't, you know, in the year of our Lord, 17. It was like 2017. And so I stood up because then I looked around and I, I could see all these women. I could see people of color. I could see so many people who could have contributed to this panel who had not been selected. And um, I stood up and I also could see that there were five people in the room, five women in the room. There are plenty of men in the room who could have stood up. But it was an odd, it was it is and was an odd time, um, but there are five of us who could have stood up to speak, and I say that because if you're going to confront something like this in a public forum, you almost have to be unassailable. Um, so I had already been president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology. I was already a full professor somewhere. I was already. X and Y and Z, and, and, and I have some cachet of being a relatively nice and funny person to be with, right? So like kind of people like me-ish. They don't know me very well, so they like me. So um, I stood up at the microphone, and I looked at these five women, and four of them are from the Midwest, and they're nice and normal, and mm -hmm. one is from New York. So I stood up from New York, and I stood at the microphone, and I said, and the way you do this is you put your feet a little bit apart so you don't topple over and you, <laughs> you take a big breath and then you say your name and your city because you can pretty much say that to, to regulate the, the tone of your voice. So you pretty much know those things. And I said, I want to congratulate you on an excellent mammal. A mammal is a men's only panel and I think it's disrespectful of our society to disregard the diversity in our membership. 
And this was exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> it was so quiet. It was like, um, it was super quiet. And then suddenly it was a big rush of applause because people could see, and it was the emperor has no clothes. There was nothing wrong with the people on the panel. They were wonderful doctors, wonderful speakers, but unless you deliberately make your panels, make your product look the way you want the future to look, the future will never look that way. And then, um, and then so after that, and I, I got to write a, a really, um, what I found very enjoyable to write, editorial in otology and neurotology, just kind of going through the data of who had been selected for um, speaking roles and for named speaking roles at the AOS and the ANS. And you can see that um, black probably means white male in these, in these graphs. Um, but I think after that, the rules were changed so that there is diversity as part of the process of selecting speakers for these conferences. And I think those are really the way to make these changes. We also experienced bias from patients. So um, this is an article in the Times relatively recently. The patients can, uh, will come in and say, no, I don't want to see that doctor. I want to see a white doctor. I want to see a doctor who's not Muslim. And this is a big deal in England where they don't want to see a, a Paki, which is what uh, Indians and Pakistanis and anybody from the Middle East is called. Um, I want to see a male doctor. Um, when, uh, and, and, you know, and unfortunately a lot of hospitals really like good Yelp reviews, I guess, or Press Ganey reviews or something, and they will acquiesce. And I think that's unfair to the patient. They may not be getting the best doctor, but it's unfair to the physician and the team because it undermines that team. Um, when a woman or a person of color, a uh, physician is finished explaining things, they often will say, well, when's the doctor coming in? Because I'd like to hear from them, even though you've introduced yourself. And then, you know, this happens to me all the time. If I walk into a room or an encounter with a very nice, you know, nice, polite male resident, the, 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 the head swivels like this. And the patient and their family is looking at my male counterpart and they are put in this awkward position of saying, oh, well, you know, she's the attending or she's the doctor, she's the doctor. Because, and, and you kind of need that because you need, in that way, you do need somebody else to speak up for you. Um, so uh, 822 U.S. physicians were surveyed and 60% had heard offensive remarks about a personal characteristic. So their youth, because we've all had that, and then the day that that stopped, it was really sad. <laughs> I was kind of sad. I was so sad when, that I was sad when they talked about how young I was when they stopped talking about how young I was. Um, about their gender. Um, I once I came home in this like state, and I said to my husband, I need to ask you something. You and I have four children. They are the same four children. Has anyone in any workplace you've ever been asked you, how do you take care of your children? And I'm like, I get asked that at least once a week still. And I don't take care of them at all. One, the last <laughs> one college, I don't know. Somebody's paying the bills. I guess it's my husband. I don't know. Um, but I'm like, and I have these pat answers. Oh, I leave out a bowl of milk. Oh, do you have to take care of them? Like I have a, I'm like a very quick repartee. But never not once has he been asked, oh, you have four children. How do you do it? Right? Um, I... People ask, uh, um, criticize on youthfulness, gender, race, ethnicity. 12% of physicians endured offensive remarks about their weight. I think it's only 12% because we just brush off everything. I remember I was about to put a needle into somebody's ear for an intertympanic injection, and the husband says to me, so when's your baby due? And I'm like, what? <laughs> And my, 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 I had had only three children at the time, and my youngest was like five years old, and I wasn't planning on the fourth one. That was just a, a happy surprise, but later. Um, and, and I pulled it, I was like, excuse me, because I thought maybe I misheard something. When's your baby do? I said, and she's, he must have had some frontal lobe dementia. <laughs> but 
um, she's like, Harry, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, excuse me. I said, no, no, my baby's five. And he's like, if I go back in, he goes, oh, your house must be a mess. Oh, my like, God. What? So I come out again. Because I'm like, I'm just trying to stick a needle into your wife's ear. <laughs> and um, I was like, excuse me? Well, look at your stomach. You must not bend over to pick up your kid's toys. I mean, he took it to there, right? And, and when I told my male colleagues, they thought I was making it up. Because, you know, I tend to make things up. But I didn't. And it was real. So, and I think, like, those are just weird things to be told by patients when you're trying to give care. And people who are targeted tend to be people perceived as not act, not first thinking perceived as physicians. So what about artificial intelligence? It's a brave new world. We're in Silicon Valley. It's going to fix everything. No. So um, three text-to-image AI generators were evaluated, 2,400 images in all. And then they looked at 1,200 images based on geographic prompts for the US, for China, and for Nigeria. Otolaryngology and seven other surgical fields were included. And the prompt was, please give me a photo of the face of an otolaryngologist. Two of the three, two of the three which are leading publicly available text to image generators depicted 98% of the surgeons as white and male. One was pretty okay about attending surgeons and all three underestimated trainee representation. So even among trainees, where we're so proud that 50% of our medical schools are women and you know, 35, 40% of our residencies are women, we're trying to get people of color into the pipeline, AI doesn't buy that at all and, and portrays everybody else as Marcus Welby. So I think, I think artificial intelligence will be garbage in, garbage out, or will be good material in, good material out. And that's up to humans to make sure the good material is there. So we're going to learn some more terms. So microaggressions and macroaggressions, they're not the Oxford English Dictionary Word of the Year, RIS, which stands for charismatic. And Timothy Chalamet has RIS. And I don't think anybody in this room actually has RIS. But, um, but they are very important words. So these are the two main forms of racial or discriminatory insults. And they tend to target race, gender, disability, economic status, or whatever the overall difference from whatever the norm is considered of an individual. An ally is somebody who is not of that group, who is actively supportive and, um, uh, and uh, associates in a supportive manner with that individual or that group. So Archie Bunker, macroaggressive. He said the weirdest, I mean, if you guys have not seen All, of the all in the Family, it's the way I learned about how to become an American. <laughs> it was great. It was an amazing show. Amazing show. Um, but the macroaggressions are, I don't like you because you are, and then fill in whatever derogatory thing about you, right? And again, that's easier to, it was easy to make fun of Archie Bunker. It was easy to identify that he was just bombastic and, and bad. Microaggressions are everyday verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights, that messages. I've been asked in a white coat in a hospital, excuse me, do you speak English? I'm like, well, as much as Americans speak English. Um, nurse, can you find me the doctor? Are there any American doctors in this place? I just read a story about uh, a nurse in Scotland who was an amazing ally. The patient said, no, I don't want to see Dr. Ahmed or whatever. Um, I want to see a Scottish doctor. And she looked at the patient. She said, what do you think Scottish doctors look like? And she just turned it right back on him and, and got the patient to accept. Because you also want to deliver good health care, right? The center of our focus is patient and patient time, patient's families. So how do you go from observing this to becoming an ally? So the agent actively joins in the negative behavior. A passive bystander just keeps their mouths shut. Maybe they go one step further and they kind of learn about biases and learn about 
the struggles of being an African American gay um, person in Indiana. I don't know, like whatever, whatever the problem, the problem um, is. But an active ally interrupts the behavior, um, interrupts and educates the person doing the behavior, or maybe even initiates an organizational response that works. Not just that stupid test you have to take online that makes you crazy, but an actual organizational response, like maybe Tina inviting me to come speak here, or the guy in at, um, the other place inviting me to speak, to just kind of open people's eyes. So this is a cartoon um, by, um, she goes by Shirley Whirl. She's got some amazing cartoons, this physician. And so the, the professor is saying, excellent presentation, but you know, here's some feedback. You should consider changing your hair. It's very big and it doesn't look professional. And this uh, African-American woman with, I think, really beautiful hair um, is saying, oh, okay. And, you know, you, what are you going to say? Your professor is saying that. Her friend, who has also quite a big amount of hair, says, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, he's just really old-fashioned. But, you know, people tell me I should get my hair straightened, too. Well, that doesn't help anybody. But if she said, excuse me, doctor, but I don't really understand why her hair has anything to do with the quality of the health care that she gives. And that's very brave. Like I told you, there were five women who could have stood up at that meeting. You, you have to be in a position where you are safe to do so. If you are not in that position and you can't stop that doctor right then, you have allies, men and women, in your department and in your institution and you can say, hey, this happened, and I don't think it should have happened. And can you help me make this not happen again? I don't want to see her taken down like that. She gave a great presentation, right? So there are ways. You can, in business, it's called send A to C, B, right? Because <laughs> you can't do it, but A could do it, right? So let that person help you. And that person is somebody that you feel comfortable discussing this with. So... My macroaggressions that reinforce <clears throat> microaggressions exist. So if you look at the RVU, the relative value unit model of healthcare that we have here, GYN procedures that are as demanding or more demanding surgically than GU procedures, so procedures performed on women versus, versus similar procedures performed on men have much lower reimbursement rates. So that immediately devalues the people doing GYN procedures, the people receiving GYN procedures, and it devalues them both overall and economically. Because a hospital that's not making as much money on procedure X on a woman that it would make on procedure Y, which is very similar on a man, is going to put more resources into procedure Y. So the male-specific procedures have a median RVU of 25. So you multiply that by some number and you get whatever you get paid for it. And it depends on your geographical area. I don't know if the residents know that, but that's how RVUs work. 25 versus 7.5 for female-specific procedures. And good news, the payment for female-specific procedures have increased 26%. The, male, the increase for male procedures has increased 13%. And if you just take those baseline numbers, that means that the male procedures now pay 28.5 and the women procedures pay 9.45. So it sounds like a great number, but these are real issues. And it's, and it's why we actually, just today, some news came out that there is a single enzyme responsible for um, hyperemesis for, uh, oh my God, I've had four pregnancies and I don't know what it's called, for like vomiting when you're pregnant. Yeah, yeah. Morning sickness. Thank you. <laughs> That's a long time ago. So we just found out today. It's 2023, December, right? We don't really understand endometriosis. We don't, you know, we breast cancer finally made it into, into the limelight um, not that long ago. So, so no resources are put into things that are considered devalued. What about for us? 
So we have a code that's tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy under age 12 and tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy over age 12. And I'm like, how could that pay differently? That doesn't even make any sense. It's not a huge difference, but it's a difference. If you're operating on kids, it's 8.69. And if you're operating on adults, it's 9.08. And nobody can tell me that it's easier to do a TNA on a child than an adult. Nobody can tell me the anesthesia is easier. Nobody can tell me that the post-op care is easier. Right? It just doesn't make sense. So we just devalue. So now we're devaluing children and their pain and their discomfort, but we're devaluing the surgeons and the teams who are doing those cases. And it's all very subtle. And if you're not looking at it, because who wants to look at it, it's very unpleasant, you're not going to see it. So there's another word I just want to introduce into the lexicon for today. It's called intersectionality. And that means that you're, so standing in front of you is not just a woman surgeon, but I'm a woman surgeon, immigrant, Indian American, married, multi-gravita, 60, right? So I've got all of those things, New Yorker. New Yorker really overshadows the whole thing. Because if you cut me, there's just dirt that comes out of my hair. But, so, so if you happen to be a black woman, a gay man uh, who's Puerto Rican, uh, you know, if you have some intersectionality, it's actually these implicit biases have some multiple. Uh, we don't know what that multiple is, but it has some multiple. So it's actually worse. So there's a, something called the imposter syndrome. And I just wanted to say that RBF, which some of the residents might know what that means. In the 1890s, it was resting bicycle face. And um, women who rode bicycles uh, were not altogether a lovely object. Unless she intends to be a professional, she should leave this, uh, this form of amusement to men. Her back is doubled into a bow knot, her hat is awry, her hair is disheveled, and her face is scarlet with exertion. And she's a hot mess because <laughs> that bicycle gave her the freedom to go from point A to point B to point C to point Z without asking somebody else for a ride or for permission. So there was some freedom associated when women were allowed to ride bicycles. So, Imposter syndrome was first described as imposter phenomenon, and you can see that I am an imposter because I looked up the spelling repeatedly, and you can spell it with two O's or with an O and an E, so I spelled it both ways. Um, but imposter phenomenon is this, you know, absolutely beautiful, accomplished, top of her game woman who, when she looks at herself in the mirror, is ashamed and does not see anything but her failures. And this concept was that therapeutic approaches need to be found to help women change their imposter self-concept. Um, so we always thought of it as something that was the, the person's fault. But actually, it is the institution's fault. So feeling unsure should not make you an imposter. When you start your internship, if you don't know less as a PGY-1 that you, than you know as a PGY-5, somebody has failed you along the way. But not knowing doesn't make you not worthy of being there, right? And so what we're finding is that people feel insecure where they are, and then there are these uh, institutional biases or implicit biases that exacerbate those feelings of doubt. The same systems that reward confidence in male leaders, even if they're incompetent, Bill Belichick, punish white women for lacking confidence and women of color for showing too much confidence, and all women for demonstrating in a way that's deemed unacceptable. I once spoke to a uh, communication consultant at Mount Sinai because I was really having trouble getting my expectations across to a couple of my residents. And I said, you know, I speak English really clearly. It is my second language. I make sure that the words are right. I try to explain why I want them to come to the OR prepared or with a plan or whatever it was. And she said, well, explain, you know, tell me how you say that. And I told her. And she said, well, your problem is you look like a woman, but you talk like a man. And I'm like, okay, what the F does that mean, right? <laughs> and apparently I was supposed to say, like, oh, my God, your sweater is so nice. Also, do you think you could just 
bring the CAT scan to the operating room, right? I'm like, what are you talking about? I look like a surgeon and I talk like a surgeon and that's what I talk about. So, so the problem is not, so the, the onus was put on me to figure a different way of speaking, but also be efficient, but also see as many patients, but also do as many surgeons, blah, 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 blah. So the idea is let's fix, let's identify our biases, fix our bias, and let people thrive. Because when we let people thrive, the whole place gets better. So I just like this cartoon. Imposter syndrome is, you know, all the things I talked about. Also, if you're an actual imposter like you, you know, which is very funny. But this is, this is how I used to feel. And sometimes I still do feel. Everyone knows what they're talking about. Everyone knows what they're doing. I'm the only one who doesn't know. And you can see that every single person. So let's call this like the residence here, right? <laughs> Everybody thinks the same thing. Ignorance is not incompetence. Being allowed to ask questions in a way that is comfortable and that you will actually learn something um, makes everybody better. So why do we care about this? Does unconscious bias actually do harm? Yes. This was a horrifying study of 1.8 million consecutive births in Florida. Black babies were three times more likely to die in the hospital than white newborns when they were cared for by white doctors. When black babies cared for black, black doctors cared for black babies, that mortality rate was cut in half. The white babies, it didn't matter what the race was of the doctor. And this had nothing to do with maternal mortality or morbidity the race of the mother's doctor. This was a neonatologist or a pediatrician taking care of a neonate. And so this goes to what's called racial concordance. And this is clearly implicit bias at work because none of these white doctors wanted to harm the babies they were in charge of, right? No, I mean, how can you have an opinion about that? I'll tell you, I've had four of them. They're very boring when they're just born. They're just small things that you just have to look at, right? So there's no reason to have an opinion about them. But this is horrendous. And if this is what's happening, which it is, we need to do something about this. Can implicit or unconscious bias do any good? It actually can. When there is racial concordance, they did a study of a bunch of men in Oakland, California, and they either had a black doctor or a non-black doctor, and all the men were black. And if there was racial concordance, there was better uh, testing, there was better uh, preemptive care, um, they were more likely to discuss their other health problems, and the notes were a little bit more uh, graphic and detailed about, um, about the patient and about their life. So it can help, and then those of us who are not black doctors should be able to learn and incorporate those strategies so that we too can take care of black people. Women patients face implicit bias. There's something called gaslighting and medical gaslighting is unfortunately quite common. Gaslighting is based on a play about a man who is driving his wife crazy little by little by slowly turning down the gas lamps in their house like, and not telling her. So she felt like her world was getting darker and darker and he was like literally gaslighting her was, was the basis of this work. So women presenting with an acute MI, okay, you would think, okay, we know this stuff, you just rush them to the cath lab, you put some medicine in their veins, something happens. Nope, if female patients with an acute MI, which you know women have different symptoms than men, but we've known that for a long time, um, if they were taken care of by a female physician, they had two or three times higher survival rates than if they were taken care by a man. Male physicians got better at taking care of female patients if they actually worked along female physicians, which is kind of funny. But basically, we need to know that some certain people, people's complaints or findings are discounted because of implicit bias and not because of any science. So there's hysteria, so the word hysterical comes from uterus, right? So these are problems that are just arise in women because we're just crazy. And 
Um, that happens all the time, and that happens between male uh, and female caregivers and women patients. So the woman doctor is saying, don't worry, it's probably just hormones, and the female patient is like, but can you, is there a way to check that? Is there some science behind whatever you're telling me? Um, you can read the slide as well as I can. You'll, we know, and I know in my experience, dizzy patients will come in, uh, especially dizzy women, with atypical dizziness that doesn't fall quickly into a box, and, um, you know, they're quite astonished that I'm taking the time and effort to take care of them and to listen to them um, and, and hopefully help them to some degree. I had one guy tell me on a panel, he just looked at me in front of all these people in the audience, one of my colleagues, and he said, oh, Suj, your patients just get better because you're so nice. And I'm like, that's very nice. But actually, they get better because here's their audiograms, right? So, I mean, it is what it is. Women physicians, there's been a lot of studies about lower mortality, lower readmissions. Um, but even with all of this data, breast gainy scores, uh, women gynecologists are 47% less likely to receive top patient satisfaction scores. Some of this is that the expectations of women doctors is very different. So we're expected to be more nurturing. We're expected to care more about your family and your circumstance. We're expected to remember that you went to Hawaii for your 50th wedding anniversary. I write everything down. People think I have a great memory. It's all written down in my charts. Um, you know, we're expected to be more nurturing, even in residency programs. I was expected as a chief resident to be nurturing to the handful of women who are behind me, but my male counterparts were expected to just learn how to become ENT surgeons. They didn't have a den mother assignment. Women faculty are expected to spend more time in a nurturing type of role than male fac faculty are. And these are expectations that have to be shown so that the expectations can be as honest and as meaningful as possible. We saw in COVID-19 the incredible disparity in outcomes based on race, and we had, you guys had a walkout, every, every institution had a walkout regarding this. One of the reasons is a, is a significant distrust of the medical system, and one, if you heard about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, this was an experiment that lasted uh, 40 years. It only ended in 1972 right around the time that that Archie Bunker episode came out. Um, and this was an absolute abomination where the government had a bunch of yes men around and thought that it would be fine to inject syphilis into a bunch of black sharecroppers and just see what happens. We knew what happened with syphilis and we had penicillin. So the, the distrust, the mistrust of the medical system has to be overcome so that we can give care to people. So black and women leaving, uh, black and women uh, doctors leaving medicine is a crisis. Um, we're about 50% of medical school classes, about 35% of practicing doctors. I don't know why it's only 76%, but 76% of women doctors report experiencing gender discrimination. Um, you know, I mean, it, it was so awful that we used to wear our scrub shirts backwards because people would look down your and, and there was nothing to look at, and people were looking down, right? I mean, it was just horrible, and we didn't even think about it because it was like a, a day, you know? Um, black doctors leave, and a lot of women go part-time or leave medicine within six years after residency. There's a woman called Ushe Blackstock and her sister, and they are doing a lot of really interesting work in this area, and if you want to follow somebody, um, she really ha brings a lot uh, to the table. So why are we leaving medicine? So disrespect is the number one from employers, from colleagues, from patients, from nurses, from everybody. You know, that's an excellent suggestion, Ms. Triggs. Maybe one of the men would like to make it. Oh, thanks for letting me know, doctor. I'm going to go just check on Google and see what Google says, right? Um, pay disparity is a huge problem. The red line is white men. The next line is black men. Then we get to white women and black women. So we're just consistently um, underpaid for the same level of work, or maybe better work since our outcomes are better. Loneliness, isolation, feeling like an imposter, not being part of the group. 
Um, and then family responsibilities. I gave a talk on time management at the Canadian Society of Otolaryngology a few years ago in beautiful Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, Canada. If you've never been there, don't go. It's brown. Um, but, you know, I looked up like a oh, woman multitasking and man multitasking. And the woman multitasking includes a broom and a mop and a, a grocery bag and a laptop and a child. And the man multitasking is like some computers, some sports equipment, a couple of beers, right? And it's a different level of expectation. So why women leave faculty jobs? Everyone says, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna care about work-life balance. It turns out men and women care about it the same. Some random professional reasons Neither of those are true. Why do we leave? We leave because the weather inside is frightful. Because the climate that we work in is just horrible. And it is actually why I left Mount Sinai. I left Mount Sinai because there was a power play that I was very, um, uh, very naive to. And there were two people who had, who had to be taken out of the equation for the power play to work. And the man was accused of um, Medicare fraud, which that guy would, re would walk a mile to return a quarter if somebody like over gave him change at the grocery store. And I was accused of having a significant personality problem and anger management problem and being, uh, I can't even tell you what I was accused of. Um, the least horrible thing that happened to me at the onset of this process was that I had to literally pee in a cup while a lady watched me in the same room so that I wouldn't miraculously switch cups with, I don't know who I was going to switch cups with. But the way we are attacked is different. The way we are treated is different. Even people with the best intentions don't recognize their implicit biases and they don't don't overcome them. So in otolaryngology, we have the smallest presence of underrepresented in medicine uh, people. Um, over a third of patients have matriculated, one or few. So underrepresented minorities are different than underrepresented in medicine. So Asians get taken out of the equation because like we're everywhere. Um, but there was an association that if you had an underrepresented in medicine faculty member, you were more likely to have underrepresented in medicine residents. And this happened in people of color and this happens with women. And so mentorship is really very, very important. So many, many people experience implicit bias both as patients and as healthcare professionals. Um, and um, of all of these, the group that's really not protected is people who are fat shamed. There's a really um, eloquent Twitter thread by a woman who wanted to go to the doctor for, I don't know, she had a cut or a bite or something, and all they could talk about was her obesity. And she's like, but I just wanted my acute problem taken care of, et cetera. And I put up this picture, the Drew Carey show was um, uh, quite popular for some time. And what I found great about it is it never fat shamed this character. This character, not once in seven or eight seasons, was fat shamed. She was shamed, because she was a crazy character, for her crazy makeup, her crazy clothes, the things that she had control over. And that was a deliberate decision by Drew Carey and the writers to, to overcome the obvious implicit bias here and go for what would really be funny. So diversity gives better patient care and better outcomes, and we have that from Hopkins, we have that from public companies, when you have a diverse board, when you have a diverse workforce, everybody does better. Um, so how do we do this? You have to recognize that there are so many types of implicit biases um, that they act in a really interesting and bad way most of the time, and they include gender bias, but ageism, name bias, they've done, you know, resumes with a a white sounding name and a not white sounding name and the not white sounding name never gets called. Height bias, if you're a short guy you might, and you live in Florida, you might be wearing something in your heel to lift you up. Come on, you gotta, come on, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny that there are two Indian people like at that level too to me, but okay. Um, so um, take some concrete steps. So what can you do? You can actually on your own time 
take the implicit assessment test and just see where you are and where you'd like to be. Um, and I think it's not pejorative. It just gives you a snapshot of yourself and gives you something where you're like, oh, I can work on this, right? And I think that's really important. Ellen Friedman has this most beautiful seven-minute video. I watched it again today just to make sure that my um, link was correct. It's beautiful, and it talks about all the things we bring to work every single day. Our family member is sick. The traffic was heavy. The, my kid decided to change his major one more time. You know, my blah, blah, blah. Like, who knows what's happened to you before you walk into that hospital? And now you're just like doing your thing and you're not really aware of all the, that you are conveying to other people. And this is really, really beautiful. I strongly urge you to watch it. And then it comes with like a little self-teaching uh, thing. If, you, if the residents have like a little program, it's something that you can add to it. But, but it's like anything else. I want to lose weight. Instead of just thinking about it like I've done for the past 18 years since my daughter was born, I might actually go to a gym. Well, I went to a gym today in the hotel and just looked at it. So the next step <laughs> might be to actually do something active in the gym. Right? So it's just taking these steps to, to make yourself what you want to be. So I think be conscious of your own implicit biases. Recognize these aggressions. Don't, if somebody says to you, this happened to me, believe them. It's really important. Don't make them prove it to you. Be an ally and be an aggressive ally when you can and when it's safe for you. Um, don't pa participate in discriminatory science. Um, there's a huge advantages that diversity confers. So we can make this world better. And it's really being deliberate, being kind, and leading. Um, and I want to thank you because we can close the door on all isms this way. I want to congratulate you on your second year of being the best program in the country. And I'm happy to answer any questions and happy to continue the dialogue whenever you'd like.